section of the discussion. Um, we're going to have a conversation this evening in dialogue about Dr. Ryle's new book, Spontaneous Happiness, and explore food and happiness in a little bit different way than what's been going on in the conference. I think we're going to be a lot more convivial. We're going to talk about how food makes us happy, but also the other attributes in spontaneous happiness and how to do that. Um, this is the annual public discussion on the issues of food in conjunction with the Nutrition and Health Conference by the University of Arizona Center for Integrative Medicine. I'm Tara LeMay, and I'll be curating the conversation tonight. As I said, we're going to be pretty interactive, so we'll be conversational up here and dialogue with each other for a while. Uh, we're going to engage you in some happiness activities with us, and our goal for the evening is to leave both smarter than we were and happier than we were. So. Prepare your questions, because the last 30 minutes we have some mics for questioning. And the other question I would ask is, uh, prepare yourself for anyone here who is willing to be part of our laughter coalition and help lead a little bit of uh, laughter activity with us. And that's going to happen before we get to Q&A. So with that, let me introduce our panelists. As most of you know who are here for the conference, and welcome to those in the public, we have Dr. Andrew Weil who is a world-renowned leader and pioneer in the field of integrative medicine. Dr. Wall combines a solid medical education with a lifetime practice of natural and preventive health care. As many of you know, he's a best-selling author with nine books. I think it's nine now. Twelve. Twelve. Okay. Twelve <laughs> books, um, including Spontaneous Healing, Healthy Aging, Eight Weeks to Optimum Health, and the recent Spontaneous Happiness. He's a frequent guest on uh, things like Larry King Live when Larry was there now with others, um, Oprah while well, she was there, and now with others, and PBS. Um, and joining us tonight is Boston's own chef, Jody Adams. I'm really excited about this because every time in the public forum we have chefs together with doctors, we get into a really interesting conversation, not just about how nutrition affects us, but how to make this food happen. She's a James Beard Award winner, the chef and owner of Rialto here in Cambridge, and the chef and co-owner of Trade, She's been praised for her creativity and support of local farmers, her charitable work, um, and as many of you know, was a top chef master. Now, amongst the other things she got to do was make a meal for uh, the Simpsons, for Lisa, which was a vegetarian <laughs> meal. Um, and I think we'll talk a little bit about what she learned from this crazy experience on Top Chef. Um, Jody's culinary career began after graduating with a degree in anthropology from Brown University. So we're going to start the evening with a little bit of interaction. Before I get involved in public talks, I always do a little bit of breathing, as I learned from Andy. So I'm hoping he'll lead us in a little bit of breathing as well. Uh, sure. Uh, I talked, made reference this afternoon to uh, the 478 breath as the most powerful intervention I've ever discovered for controlling anxiety and centering. Uh, so maybe we could begin by doing that. Um, if you're familiar with it, you will know how to do it, and for those of you who aren't, I'll explain it and demonstrate it. Uh, this is a breath that comes from yoga, although I learned it from an old osteopathic physician who was a master healer. Uh, I will describe it to you, then I'll demonstrate it for you, and then we'll do it together. Um, in this kind of breathing, uh, you can do it in any position, but it's good to have your, if you're seated, to have your feet on, your, on the floor and your back straight, and your tongue in the yogic position, which is touching the tip of your tongue to the bridge of tissue behind and, and uh, above your upper front teeth, like that. You're going to keep it there the whole time. So in this exercise, you're going to uh, breathe in through your nose quietly and out through your mouth, making a sound. So you're going to blow air out through your mouth with your lips pursed outward. You'll blow around your tongue. And uh, the exercise begins by letting all the air out through your mouth, then closing your lips and breathing in quietly through your nose to a count of four, holding your breath for a count of seven, and then blowing the air out through your mouth to a count of eight. And you're going to repeat that for four breath cycles. Uh, so let me demonstrate it to you. Just watch, and then we'll do it together, and I'll count for you. This is what it looks like. <sighs> Thank <laughs> you. 
So that's it. Okay, let's do this together. What limits you is how long you can comfortably hold your breath. So you've got to get enough air in on the four to last you for the seven. Uh, I will count at a moderate rate that should be comfortable for you as you practice this. It's good to slow the whole thing down. Okay, so let all the air out through your mouth. Close your mouth in through your nose. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Close in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Close in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. One more in. Two, three, four. Hold. Two, three, four, five, six, seven. Out. Two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Now just breathe normally. Uh, notice any changes you feel. You may feel a little lightheaded doing that. If you haven't done it before, that's not the aim. That will disappear with practice. This is a practice, uh, and it's something I would recommend that you do this at least twice a day, religiously. Um, if you practice this, never more than four breaths at one time for the first month. Uh, very powerful changes will happen after doing this for six to eight weeks. This really changes the tone of your involuntary nervous system. But just doing it here in this session, it's a good centering exercise, so we have breathed together. And none of us got to sound like Darth Vader breathing out as Andy <laughs> did. So, um, so Andy, just for opening the session up, can you share a little bit with everyone uh, beyond the, the pure nutritional aspect with the conference, what you learned in doing the book and what you think uh, should provoke the conversation this evening? Well, first of all, I became happier as a result of writing that book. Um, there were a lot of things that surprised me. Uh, for example, uh, I really had no idea that there had been scientific research on the power of gratitude to boost mood. Um, there's, a, uh, there's two aspects to gratitude. One is feeling grateful and the other is expressing it. Um, there's an exercise from the field of positive psychology called keeping a gratitude journal, which some of you may know. You get a little notebook. Um, and during the day, make mental notes about things to be grateful for, which could be as simple as the sun rising or seeing a beautiful flower or meeting a friend, having food. At night when you go to bed, you just jot these down. Uh, doing this for one week has been shown to boost mood for up to six months. I mean, that's amazing, and there's nothing that's in the way of it. You know, the, all you have to do is remember to do it. There's also a lot of scientific research on the power of forgiveness to boost mood, but forgiveness is tricky. <laughs> Uh, a lot of things can get in the way of practicing forgiveness. I'm not going to go there. But with gratitude, all you have to do is remember to do it. <coughs> I also was interested to discover uh, that uh, a, a lot of research has been done on the contagiousness of moods. Uh, you can track the spread of moods through populations just as you can track the spread of infectious illnesses. Uh, for example, if you have a friend uh, who lives within a half mile of you who becomes happy, your chances of being happy are increased by 35%. And the effect falls off with distance. And beyond a certain distance, there's no effect. I mean, that's an argument for being careful about who you associate with uh, and uh, making an effort to spend more time in the company of people who have positive moods and make you feel more optimistic. Now, those are some simple things that I learned. So Jody, uh, share with everyone a little bit, how did you make the transition from uh, anthropology to being a chef? I think the photos we just saw were a little bit of that journey as well. Well, it had everything to do actually with happiness because um, I did not know what I wanted to do as an undergraduate, but I had spent time um, in Guatemala with my uncle who was a Latin American anthropologist and it seemed like a perfect solution to uncertainty. And, but once I got out, I realized that I wasn't going to be an academic. Sitting still was not for me. And I pursued um, an interest that I had, which was in um, the nursing profession. And I did that for a couple of years and realized that I was not happy. I was 24 years old, and it seemed to me that wasn't a very good start to a professional life. So. 
I went back to thinking about what was it that I had done in my life that made me feel most like myself. And it was always in a kitchen. It was moving. It was um, making great food that made people happy. Um, lots of gratitude, lots of grace. And um, so that's how I started. And the anthropology played in because it is through anthropology that I learned about different cultures. And I think it set me up to be curious about why people eat the way they do and has influenced the kinds of cuisines that I've pursued. Tara, you know, I was, um, as you know, I'm a very passionate cook. And I first really started cooking when I was in medical school. And it was to get my head in order. Uh, I went to medical school here in Boston. And in those days, uh, you had to work 72-hour shifts quite regularly in hospitals. And it was just dreadful. I mean, everything about being in the hospital for 72 hours was just awful. The, the physical environment, these were dirty old hospitals. You couldn't see the outside. The food available was horrendous. And I would be in such a bad mental state when I came out. Uh, I found that preparing something wonderful for myself was a great way to get back into a good emotional state. And the act of envisioning something that I was going to make, uh, concentrating on chopping vegetables and doing things and then cooking and manifesting the vision that I had. And by the time I sat down to eat it, you know, I felt like a human being again. You know, I, th I think it's really interesting. One of the threads that run through the book, and you know, you have a, a discussion about uh, Seligman's interventions about boosting happiness. One was sensory pleasure. The second was flow state or being fully absorbed. And the third was the fulfillment of something higher than themselves or, okay. or a shared being. And when you think about cooking, that's frequently the act, the sensory pleasure, the sensory effect of all the ingredients coming together, the flow state of preparing it and then the joy you get from giving it to other people. It seems like it's a meditation in itself and that seems to be what you're describing. And yet, we really lost the tradition of cooking. So do you guys have thoughts on how we can bring that back? Well, I, th I, th I think that, well, cooking, first of all, cooking is um, one of, I think, the most natural things to do. It's not very hard. And I, and, and I think that the c profession, and I'm part of that, has really removed it from accessibility for people. It's made it like you're supposed to have the most perfect ingredients and you have to have the perfect knives and the perfect equipment. And truly, you just need some really wonderful ingredients and fresh and a good knife and a cutting board and off you go. And then to recognize the satisfaction of the process and looking at what you're cooking and patting yourself on the back for your perfect um, knife cuts and uh, smelling and tasting and I don't know, I, I think there's so much in cooking that is so incredibly satisfying and getting people to fall in love with it again, I think is what we need to do. You know, I've always felt that cooking is practical magic uh, and great training for life. Uh, an, an essence of magic is trying to manifest in the real world something that you have inside your head. So when you cook something, you have a a vision, an idea of something you want to make. You have to juggle an immense number of variables. You have to deal with changing circumstances. And to get good at that, to be able to, it doesn't have to be complicated dishes, but to do that, I think that's wonderful training. And it carries over into many other aspects of life. Um, so I think all that's wonderful. The trend away from cooking in this society is just dreadful. And it's gone incredibly far. There's a story that uh, I love to tell. Um, some years ago, I did a cookbook with Rosie Daly, who was o had been Oprah's chef uh, for a number of years. It was called The Healthy Kitchen. And uh, when we went out on book tour, Rosie told a story which I liked so much, I asked her if she'd let me tell it whenever we appeared. And it was that when she worked for Oprah, she had rented a very high-end uh, apartment in Chicago. And when she left Oprah at the end of, I think, seven years, she could not get her deposit back on the apartment because, quote, the kitchen had been used, unquote. <laughs> I think that just says everything about where we are today. Uh, the, the, the number of people in this country who sit down to even one meal together is shockingly small. 
and the number of people who actually cook is shockingly small. And you know, lots of people watch the Food Channel, but I'm not sure that gets them into the kitchen. Well, <laughs> I think that I think that in the you know watching food shows is sort of interesting. On one side, you've got Iron Chef, which is like uh, food as war. And then on the other side, you may have a Rachel Ray, which is how do you use fast, quick ingredients that are not necessarily cooking, or they're just sort of recombining things from a Trader Joe's experience. So, you know, I have a staff of 30 in my company. None of them know how to cook, and I don't even know where to start with them on it. I mean, I mean, this is a cultural thing. I've read that the average Italian man by the age of 18 can make a good tomato sauce and a few other basic dishes. I mean, it's part of the culture. So how do we make that part of our culture? I, I think it's the children. It's with the children. It's with kids. I think kids are so curious and love to cook. And I had my kids cooking bef before they could reach the stove. And I'd put them on a stool and um, have them help. And of course, they both got burned, small burns, but that was like a rite of passage. That was OK. Um, and I think that, that we have a responsibility to bring that skill into schools and, um, and to get grown-ups convinced. And I know that there have been a lot of discussion about that here t um, in this conference, which I think is wonderful. But you know what you can do with your staff? Find a culinary school and um, rent the space and have a team building kind of experience. Hire somebody like me to come in and put them in teams to cook, and you'll, it's a, they'll love it. It's an amazing experience, and um, they'll love working together. They'll learn something about each other and about the process of working together that way. So, so what are the reasons people give for why they don't cook? Uh, a major one today is there's no time. You know, I don't have time to do it. Another one is I don't know how. It's too complicated. Um, or I don't have the equipment. I don't have the ingredients. Uh, some things are so simple to make, and uh, one prescription that I often give is to, you know, just learn to make one wonderful dish out of real ingredients that's not expensive, that's not time consuming, and really get that down, and uh, something that your family really likes, and then write the recipe down, share it with friends, and then you can move out from that. If you were, each of you were going to teach someone one recipe that would enhance their life and make them better, which one would it be? Oh, that's hard. I, I would say learn how to make a great, a good salad. I mean, that's so easy to do. It takes very little time. I was going to say soup. Okay, I was, was going to say soup. soup is another one. Yeah. A, a good soup, a good salad, that's a great start. And I think, um, Andy, your point about uh, starting with a structure if you look at a recipe, um, a soup recipe, if you're making uh, a butternut squash soup, it usually starts with saute some onions and oil, and add some garlic, maybe some spices, then you add the squash, cook it together, add some stock, vegetable stock, or something like that. Um, that teaches you how to make a, make a butternut squash soup recipe, but you could take the squash out and put carrots in, or asparagus, or any vegetable, um, beans and things like that, so you can um, use a base to build on. And the advantage of a soup is you can make a quantity and have it around for the better part of a week. Or freeze some. Yeah, you know, or freeze it, right. So, um, Jody, you take your staff out into the, into the fields. What, what's the story behind that? Why do you guys do that, and, and what have you learned from it? Well, I, have, I love spontaneity, and um, and I've always loved the idea of, I had this fantasy that I would get a Weber grill and put it in the back of my car and set up shop on the street somewhere and teach people to cook um, with vegetables, fresh vegetables and things like that. And that's sort of problematic. Um, but I thought I could do it with my staff uh, instead. So it, we call it Gorilla Grilling with a U. Um, and we actually, did one today. We put a little Weber grill in the back of a car. You didn't invite all of us. No, well, <laughs> it, we, it was actually a distillery today. <laughs> um, but And go to a farm or go to a clam farm or um, go to a, there's a place in Somerville here that make, where they make chocolate or to a cheesemaker. 
um, because I wanted the staff to get to know the people who produce the food that we serve to our guests, to see how the, the food is made um, because of the stories that are involved, but also to actually break bread with those people. So we bring some of our food and then we use whatever they're producing and we make a lunch and sit down. Sometimes there can be 20 of us um, and say goodbye and go on with our day. And it's, it's this very magical experience for people because there a lot of people who work with food have people come to see what they do, but not necessarily to give them a meal and that we really love doing that. Uh, what do you think is the potential for restaurants to change eating tastes, to guide people in better paths, um, to help teach some of this for chefs to be leaders in this cultural change that has to happen? Well, I think chefs can play a certain kind of role, but I think that um, really the, and uh, my restaurants aren't restaurants that necessarily kids go to or it's an everyday kind of experience for people. So I, I think that actually um, we can do our part in setting a, a certain tone, but I think that it's more complicated than that. And I think it requires people on the ground to um, work with m members of the community. But you're ra you ha have restaurants that are more everyday kind of, yeah? Right. Um, I, I partnered with a very successful restaurateur to, to develop, um, you know, my feeling was that nobody had really tried to serve really delicious food that happened to be good for you. Um, so these restaurants, True Food Kitchens, and by the way, we're planning to open one in Boston uh, in the next year, uh, serve the anti-inflammatory diet and a lot of my recipes using local sustainable ingredients. Uh, they've been very successful. They draw a lot of kids, which is great. Um, you know, one of the dishes that's been very popular is a, is a raw kale salad that's a recipe from Tuscany. Uh, I never thought Americans would be eating raw kale. Um, the secret is to let the kale sit in a dressing of lemon juice and salt and olive oil and chili flakes and garlic. Uh, for 10, 15, 20 minutes, and the kale softens and debitters. Um, and it's, I, I've been quite amazed. I was stopped, I was in the, one of the restaurants in Phoenix um, in the past year, and a, a woman stopped me, and she had two kids, a boy and a girl, who looked like they were about five and seven, and she said, uh, tell Dr. Weil what your favorite dish is. And the girl looked very shy and hid behind uh, her back, and the boy said, kale salad, kale salad. And they come in twice a week for kale salad, and we get out the recipe and she makes it at home. I mean, I think that's fabulous. And in, in some ways, I think I see the possibility of using food as a vehicle to promote awareness of health and lifestyle in general, maybe even more effective than writing books or giving lectures. You know, it seems like a great way to, to reach people. You know, I think uh, Jamie Oliver's experiment at the Food Revolution was interesting because they did put local kitchens into communities to get the communities back together to cook and eat together. And it, uh, it you know, I think it's an interesting question. There is the continuum from maybe the restaurant for celebration uh, to the home and some of the things in the middle is sort of where will people learn these things? And, and frequently we don't uh, cook or eat together anymore which I think takes away some of the issue of gratitude and some of the um, shared conviviality you talked about. I know, Andy, you talked about uh, gratitude and uh, those components in the book as being really important. So is the shared meal a place for that? Absolutely. Uh, I, I, uh, I wrote in the book that um, my family was not in the habit of saying grace before meals. And when I first encountered that, when I went out in the world, and this was in the 60s, and uh, traveling through the world of communes, and uh, you know, I was with people that were holding hands and saying om and various things. And at first I was uncomfortable about that, uh, especially if it seemed to me that it was a specific religious practice. Uh, but then I really uh, came to find that that was a good thing to do, to take a moment and just acknowledge uh, gratefulness for having food on the table. Um, a form that I particularly like, I've, I've spent a lot of time in Japan, and the traditional way of doing this in Japan 
uh, as before a meal, you place your hands together and say, itadakimasu. And uh, that's often translated as bon appetit, but it actually means I humbly receive. Uh, and that's just, a, to me, a nice neutral thing. So I often do that silently uh, when I sit down. Um, but th I think that's a, that is a, you know, I said that the trick with gratitude is simply to remember to do it. You know, we take for granted, granted and gratitude have the same root, actually. Uh, but we take for granted so many things. And sitting down to a meal or having food placed in front of you, it's just an opportunity in which to practice that, and a very easy one. So some of the research indicates that in the U.S., 67 minutes is how much time people spend eating their primary meals total in an entire day or being involved preparing and eating food. Your discussion about it being meditative, cooking, the act of cooking, would suggest that perhaps you need more than 67 minutes um, in the entire day for doing that. And, and also, you know, is it selfish? to cook? Is it selfish to take more time out for dining? Because you get the sense from a fast food culture that speed is what's important as opposed to time. Sort of where do you look at this continuum? You know, that touches on the whole issue of mindfulness, which is a big subject that we might want to talk about some. Um, in, in the book, in looking at um, the difference between Eastern and Western psychological approaches to mental health, uh, the West has mostly, psychology until recently, has mostly focused on insight-oriented therapy of trying to d d discover insight into why you develop negative patterns of thought that make you unhappy or fearful. Uh, Eastern psychology has taken a very different tack, uh, which is arguing that gathering attention together and focusing it in the present moment is a key to happiness and mental health. That's the practice of mindfulness, which has now really penetrated this culture, you know, not only in uh, mindfulness-based stress reduction, which is used a lot in medical settings, but in all sorts of things. I just uh, reviewed a book called Mindful Birthing, uh, which is teaching the practice of mindfulness to bring to the experience of childbirth. Um, actually, if you think about it, I think being mindful um, is the secret of mastery of anything. Uh, when I cook, well, I, I think I'm totally mindful. If you're cutting vegetables, you know, you, you don't, you want to be mindful of what you're doing because you can cut your finger. Um, I think an awful lot of eating in this culture has become mindless. Um, people eat in front of the television, they eat in their cars, uh, they eat while they're doing other things, that attention is scattered. Well, first of all, I think maximum sensory pleasure comes when, when attention is concentrated on the experience. Um, but I think everything is better that way. So I think cultivating the practice of mindful eating uh, would be very useful. First of all, it slows you down. Um, you know, a, a, a common problem in overeating, I mean, I know this in myself, so I know it very well, is that as one bite is going in, rather than paying attention to that, you're thinking about the next bite or reaching for it. I mean, that, that is the essence of not being mindful. So I think this is a practice. It's not something that happens overnight, but I think it's uh, would be very useful uh, to, to bring greater mindfulness to everything about food and eating. I also think that, um, and I'm, I've become very aware of this, that we have are moving always thinking about how we can eliminate physical participation in the things that we do to make things easier and go faster. And then we say, okay, and how much time do I need at the gym? So on the one hand, we're removing physical activity, and then we're trying to put it back in this artificial environment. Um, and I think that if we found joy and, and pleasure in the process of doing things physically, um, we wouldn't have to spend <laughs> so much time at the gym. I mean, if, for instance, if you're making bread and, you're, and you need the bread, if you need it by hand, you actually are building your upper body, you can work on your core, you can do, think about Pilates. Um, if you're, even if you're using a knife, you know, and you use it properly, you're using your body. Um, lifting things when you're cooking, there are all kinds of ways to um, work your body while you're cooking, and if you just don't cook and buy things that are already 